Oh, it's good to step into the arena of Advent. I've been anticipating it for some time. And this whole idea of hope as we open up this first uh, theme of Advent. What, I mean, uh, hope. We all need hope. Our world needs hope. There's a variety of things that you're probably involved in where you hope will go well and go quickly and get your tasks done. Yet in the midst of all the hustle and the bustle of Christmas and everything, there's a simple story. For some of you, you've heard it many, many times. For some of you, maybe you're hearing it afresh, anew. And that would be my encouragement to you is to slow down. That's what Advent is all about, anticipating the idea of hope and anticipating the idea of Christ being born, of God coming into the world. And so this four-week series that we're going to be working on, Um, focuses in on, as we celebrate Christmas, angels and songs, and we're going to be looking at Luke verses uh, chapters 1 and 2. So I invite you to open your Bibles to the the book of Luke. Uh, Get your cell phone out. Get to that Bible. I want you. God's Word is central here at New Life, and so I want you to see it. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, there's one there in front of you. It's on page 1012. And I'm picking this theme of angels and songs because I think there's a, a lot of misconception out there about who angels are and the role of angels and what they do. And, you know, I mean, maybe you've done a Christmas um, trivia before. Have you? Have you ever tried? There's some of these Christmas trivias out there like how many wise men came to visit Jesus? What would you say? Three, right? But yet, in reality, we don't know how many there were. We say three because of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, right? So we assume there was three. Just like angels. I mean, sometimes we think, well, what is the role of angels? And here in Luke, we're going to see one today. And so I hope in this series to kind of clarify some of our misconceptions about who angels are and how they were created and what their role is. And so as we open up, we see intruding on the routine. It was just an average day. You may not realize it, but it had been 400 years since the voice of God had been heard through a prophet. That's a long time. That's a few generations, isn't it? And so this intruding on the routine, God decides he's going to interject once again with a very loud voice. And as we open the book of Luke, it's interesting to note that Luke tells us that, uh, Marty, I'm having a little trouble with my um, clicker here today for some reason, so I may need your assistance, okay? But what he said, if you look at, if you got your books open to Luke chapter 1, I want you to see what Luke writes in those first four verses. I'm not going to read all of them, but it kind of sets the tone. He says, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know, now watch this, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. And so Luke was one who did an investigative research He talked to eyewitnesses. He discovered and he found and he took the stories that had already been written. And he said, I want to put this all together so that you can know for certainty what you have heard and what you are reading is true. And so as we look at Luke chapter one, we're going to read verses five through twenty five. And I've asked Todd to come up and read our text for today. And as our tradition here at New Life, grab this mic right here, Todd, come right on up here to the podium. Um, As our tradition here at New Life is we like to stand when God's word is read publicly. So if you're able to do that. But Todd, say a welcome to the the congregation here today. Well, good morning. It is amazing to be here. Um, Just from the first time we we came a a few, what, a month ago or so um, and visited. And since that time, um, we've just seen the fingerprint of God leading us on this journey um, from California to Wendell, Idaho. Um, and it, it, God is amazing. It's, it's all him. It's all him. There's no way that any of this uh, would happen if, if it's not God's will for us to be here. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone who's been sending emails and dropping off stuff at the house and the meals, um, the groceries basically brought us to tears, just the outpouring of love from this church family, welcoming us, welcoming us here 
It's been absolutely amazing. So thank you guys so much. And uh, we just give God all the glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to read Luke. The birth of John the Baptist foretold. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. Once, Ze- once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple For he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Great. You may be seated. Thank you so much, Todd, for reading God's Word for us today. You know, it's interesting as we begin Advent, the story of Jesus' birth does not begin with Jesus. It actually begins with John. He was a forerunner. He was the herald sent to ahead to announce the coming of Christ. In fact, in Luke 3.3, 3, it says, He went into all the country around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the interesting thing about that, it was Jews who were coming to be baptized, which was unusual. They saw themselves as the people of God, that they didn't need that baptism, but that's how effective the Spirit was moving at that time in the lives of people. God had promised this uh, Messiah to come, but before that, a messenger was going to be coming ahead of him. As we open our story, though, today, we see the people of our story, and it's interesting to note how they're characterized. That Zechariah and Elizabeth, both of them were upright in the sight of God. And what I labeled that as they were clean. Because see, in that time and in that year, in that season, the temple was a place of taking care of your sinfulness. And so you would come regularly as a family 
And you would pray your sins upon an animal that was sacrificed in front of you as a family. And that was the the travesty, the horror that you would witness to cause you to say, I have sin in my life and look at the punishment that it's taken upon this animal on my behalf. Well, praise God, we're on this side of that experience. And so we look, by the way, the cross, there it is. We look to the cross over here and recognize the travesty of that, the horror of an innocent man, God man in the flesh, sacrificed on our behalf because of our sin. That's what makes us clean. But yet God had seen and looked here, and here they were both of a priestly line of Aaron. So you have both Both of these folks come from great lineage. They were active in ministry. Both of them were involved in the working of the temple. They were distinguished by their godliness, meaning righteousness, meaning for us, Christ-likeness in our world today that needs to see hope. And maybe you're the one to demonstrate that light of hope through God's grace. Now, they weren't sinless. Let's not go there. They definitely still had sin in their life, but the point is they were in a right relationship with God. Through the actions, through the rituals, through the conformity to the law, they were following the way of God. And I'm reminded that God continually looks, even today. He's looking here right now, here in this space. He's looking for righteous people to join him in his mission, his mission of hope to a world that needs to hear the hope. And maybe it's routine, but let's listen to it afresh. Let's listen to it anew because Jesus Christ saves. Another thing to note about this couple is that they're childless, right? They're without children. They suffered this personal pain, but in that society, it was also a social disgrace. Because it was seen as God's fruitfulness in your life. Even though they are seen by God as righteous, right? The people in the community saw them as lacking. That perhaps God was not blessing them with a child. For any woman who's ever wanted a child, you know the pain that Elizabeth must endure during that time of season. She's an old woman. Never had a child. The questions... That she must have had pelted her way. The insensitive remarks that she probably heard. The pain of desire when she saw other women fertile and children everywhere. Like we've seen flourishing here in our space this morning. Elizabeth was barren. It's interesting to say in this case now it was for the glory of God, isn't it? I mean, you want to give glory to God in everything. That's part of our process here at New Life Church. But are you willing to be barren for God's glory? Because in the right time, God brought this about and that God was not punishing her, as probably some of her friends said. You need to confess your sin. You need to make it right. But instead, she was barren for God's glory. He was going to produce a miracle in her. That, and, and that Zechariah even said, how can this be true? I'm an old man. How is this even possible? And it's even greater still that God would say, that's where I'm at work. What's impossible for people is not impossible for God. Through this childlessness, he was about to perform something fantastic. Let's talk a little bit about the purity, the purity, the purity. Uh, Zacharias, he's busy, he's at work, but yet it's an act of worship. His work that he's doing there is an act of worship. And as the priest, it's amazing the details that had to come together that God orchestrated. So Zechariah would be the one in there to burn the incense and to offer the prayers on behalf of the people. He was worshiping, but our text says that outside... There were others worshiping and praying. It was a community of faith. They couldn't go into that space, but they could see the smoke rise. And that's what they were waiting for. They were waiting for God inhabits that essence of prayers going up on their behalf. That's what a priest would do. He wouldn't stand in front of the congregation like this and speaking God's word to you. Instead, he stood like this in front behind front of the people, but speaking to God on behalf of the people, saying stuff like, don't kill them. 
<laughs> Seriously. You know, the people came to Mount Sinai. It was a holy mountain, and they couldn't touch it, or they would die because God was demonstrating his holiness. God is a holy God, and he demands perfection. He demands holy people, which you're not able to give on your own, but only through the blood of Christ, that purity. And so we worship and we recognize God's power at work in us. Did you feel it? Did you feel it this week? God's power of his spirit at work in you? That you could say no to sin and say yes to something else that he would have for you? Did you feel it as you shined as a light in someone's life where you held their hand and prayed with them and said, I know it looks dark, but our God is an awesome God and he specializes in the impossible. Amen. Worship is 24-7. You know, Zechariah got to a, a point of wonder, right? It says he's standing there in the presence of, of Almighty God as what he was taught and trained. And this was his turn. It was his turn to be there. And as he's standing there, he senses he's not alone. There's a presence of a holy being. And he falls on his face before the Lord, showing great respect. You know, angels are mentioned 23 times in Luke, but only two of them are named in Scripture. Gabriel, who we see here today, and Michael. Isn't it great how his first words were, don't be afraid don't be afraid. And he starts talking about the promise. He starts reminding him of the promise. And he reassures Zechariah. And he speaks of him. Perhaps Zechariah was in there thinking, you know what? This is my time. This is my, I'm going to ask God for a son. Perhaps, I don't know. It doesn't say that in the text. I'm just exploring the idea a little bit. But wouldn't you? You had that opportunity all these years. And then the shocking thing is God provides exactly what he'd been asking for when the angel says, your prayers have been answered. You ever experienced that in your life where you're praying for something and then you go, look, God came through. It's amazing. God did something. It shocks us, right? It shouldn't. We should be expectant people. I know, God, you're at work. I know you're going to do something. I know you specialize in the impossible. It shouldn't surprise me. But here's the thing. God doesn't always fit our timeline, right? He doesn't always fit our timeline. But his timing is always right. And so we trust in him. Yet will I praise him no matter what is going on in my life. The promise of God is true. Zachariah's prayers are going to be answered. Elizabeth would bear a son. They would call him his name John, which means God has been gracious. By the grace of God, new life is coming out of a barren womb. And so there was great rejoicing. We see great rejoicing going on. Rejoicing. You know, he makes this personal request, but that's not his primary purpose in being in that room. It was a holy place, a place to pray for the people of God. And what was he praying? As the incense was rising and the people were wash, worshiping, Zechariah was inside this place praying for the salvation of Israel. I said it, don't kill him, right? It's, it's a casual comment, but that's what, really what he was praying. It's for their salvation. Outside of God's interaction, there's a destiny for all humankind, and it isn't heaven. It's the path of destruction that leads to hell. But by God's grace, he reaches out and he rescues and he restores us. So there's great rejoicing. That is the petition. And John is to be set apart for a special ministry. That's why we have this idea of repentance. Repentance. I like verse 16. It says John is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, at that time, the Holy Spirit would come and go, come and go like that. He would be upon someone to do a specialized ministry or a specialized uh, process or, per, or, or, or project. But here we see that John is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It means he's directed by God. He's set apart. That's why those special things are mentioned in there. 
But it's not through religious rituals that he belongs. It's through God's grace. And he's calling people to repent, to turn their way, to turn back from God, to stop relying on religious rituals and get back into relationship with him. And then we see the idea of revival, revival happening. I pray for that today. Don't you? I want to see revival. The objection Zechariah raises is the ones that people always raise when there's something supernatural, the power of God of changing a life. Right? Because we look at it from a human point of view. Here we see that you know, he's saying, hey, how can this be true? I'm an old man. He's got his biology right, but he's missing out on his theology, his study and understanding of who God is and what God can do. And that takes faith. It takes faith to accept God at his word and to receive God's son today it takes faith. And I'm thankful that it's God who places that in you and gives you that faith to enter into a right relationship with him through the death and resurrection of Christ. As I mentioned earlier, what's ironic is that this was the very thing that he had been praying for. And here's this angel, I am Gabriel. And we see with the announcement, hope is rekindled. We discover that God is not distant and uncaring. Zechariah's forced silence admits that his, belief, his disbelief became a posture inviting all to watch and wait with anticipation for what God is about to do. It must have been a bit comedic. When he finally came out and he couldn't speak and he's motioning with his hands, trying to tell him what happened. You know, Luke could have left this part out of the story, right? But he didn't. He includes it. He wants us to see how God dealt with Zechariah's unbelief or disbelief or his hesitation or even his confusion. He wants to tell us how Zechariah responded to the gospel so that unlike him, we can respond in faith. We can say, if God said it, I believe it, and that's good enough for me. So we get to the praise. The praise is the ending of our text here, verses 20 through 25. Somehow we got to get to the praise. How did I miss? Oh, the power. Didn't I put that up already? Again, I'm having trouble with this thing, Marty. So there's your blank for those of you who are blank fillers. Want to make sure you get all your blanks filled in right. Don't want any emails this week. What was the P on what, you know? So get your blank filled in. It's the power of God at work, and he's still alive and working today. Let's go to the next one, the praise, uh, verses 20 through 25. The angel said that all the promises would be fulfilled. There should be a praise. There we go. Thank you. As we see in the picture... Uh, already the baby John is born. But here's what our desired outcome for us today is get ready for Jesus. Getting ready for Jesus. Don't, don't miss this Advent season. Don't get caught up in the routine. Because the, celebrating the first Advent, don't forget the second Advent. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again to judge the world. He won't be a little baby in a manger. We need to get ready. We need to be check, checking ourselves and turning away from sin and making sure we're trusting in Jesus. And if you're here today and you haven't done that in your life, we've got resources available. We've got people right here who would love to talk with you. If you need that assurance of knowing when Christ comes back on that day, you're in Him. We've got plenty of folks here who want to talk to you and share with you. I'm going to close my prayer now, and after this prayer, we're going to sign off from social media, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have in the assurance of your word, that we can trust it and believe it, because you are a God who is true to your promises by following through, and you've demonstrated again and again and again, forgive us for our disbelief, forgive us for not taking you at your word. Thank you for your presence and your Holy Spirit that lives in us, that testifies that we indeed are children of the living God through the blood and the death and resurrection 
of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.